first of all, it's important that I do not claim to know how many Jewish believers in Jesus exists in mm-hmm. Israel. We will get to that in a moment because okay. there are there are secret believers, and I talked with a few of these that are not part of a congregation and that sits at home alone, and we can talk about that in a moment. Shalom and welcome to Hebrew Voices. I'm here today with Reverend David Cerner. He's the author of a book called Jesus Believing Israelis. He's also the director of the international studies at the Center for Biblical and Jewish Studies in Jerusalem. And he's a pastor of the Danish congregation of the Lutheran Church in Jerusalem. Shalom, David. Shalom, shalom. I feel like uh, the, the, in a sense, like uh, we switch places because <laughs> I'm talking, normally I talk to guests from Jerusalem and now I'm in Texas and you're in Jerusalem. Am I right? You're all right. You're, yeah. Okay. So David, uh, I actually heard you give a lecture at the World Congress of Jewish Studies, which is probably the most important uh, international conference of Jewish studies in the world. It takes place, um, I think it's like every four or five years. This year was only the 18th ever uh, in Jerusalem. And your name, your, the title of your lecture was the name of your book, Jewish uh, Jesus Believing Israelis. And you did something really fascinating that I want you to share with the audience which is you actually went out and got statistics and did surveys and found out what actually is the state of, and here I'm going to um, stumble around and fumble around for the correct terminology. So yeah. uh, the state of Messianic Jews in Israel or Jesus believing Israelis, are those the same thing? Are those different things? Talk to me about that. Yeah, so as you say, you can fumble around these terms because everybody used them differently. Right. Mm-hmm. So some people use messianic to be everybody in, you know, all, all believing Gentiles that mm-hmm. are interested in Hebraic roots and things like this. They can use the term messianic. Other mm-hmm. people use the messianic term uh, as those Jews who follow halakha. And again, mm-hmm. other use the term as a, a, a Jew that uh, believes in Jesus. So it can mm-hmm. mean many things. Uh, and that's why we have put teaching believing Israelis in our uh, title, as it does not necessarily mean all Jewish believers in Jesus, but they could also include Gentile believers. Okay, so it's really interesting. So, so, so this is this is really complicated because, like, a lot of the people I've I've met over the years would describe themselves exactly like you said. They're Messianic, but they don't claim to be Jews. They're not Jewish, but they love. Um, I, I don't, I don't know how to even put it. I don't want to put words in their mouth, right? They, they look to Yeshua as a Jew. They call him Yeshua or Yahshua or Yahusha. Some of them, they look to him as a Jew, and they say he was a Jew, uh, or he followed the Torah, right? There's many different formulations, mm. and then you have people on this other end of the spectrum, and and I look at it as a spectrum. Like people like to talk about spectrums today, in in the it, certainly in the United States in the Western world how certain things are all this, you know, uh, never ending, beautiful spectrum. But there really is a spectrum of people uh, on the one end who will be, have no connection um, to the, to Judaism, let's say by birth or culture. Um, but they'll go to a, a what they call a, a congregation or a synagogue and they'll put on a talit and they'll recite the Amidah, the, you know, the um, mm. standard rabbinical prayer, the Shimon Esrei and the 18 benedictions. And then the way other end of the, and they'll keep Shabbat and different things in different ways. And the way other end, you'll have Jews who, um, who uh, believe in Jesus and, um, and are part of like mainstream Sunday congregations. And some of those people will call themselves Messianic Jews. So, so it gets very confusing. So, and you were looking specifically at Israel. So, so I'm actually, I want to start with the question of Israelis. Does Israelis in the title of your book and your survey indicate Israeli citizens per se, or is it people who, what is the definition there? Yes. So we actually deal with it a little bit in the book. And uh, so our focus is, you can say, citizens of Israel, Mm -hmm. but uh, excluding the Arab sector. Okay. So Israelis mm-hmm. today could include the Arab sector that are, you know, Arab Israeli, mm-hmm. but in our term, we use it uh, not including the Arab Israelis, but the mm-hmm. 
uh, are the citizens of Israel. Now, the problem is, and that's the, the, the next, uh, you know, the subtitle is Exploring Messianic Fellowships. Mm-hmm. And here we use the term messianic because mm-hmm. uh, no matter how you define it, this is the most, this is the broadest term we can come up with. So that includes both Gentiles and non-Gentiles and uh, people following an uh, Orthodox halakha or praying the Shmonesre mm-hmm. or whatever they do and people who are completely uh, secular in their lifestyle, but has mm-hmm. a faith in Jesus as a Jewish Messiah. So the fellowships is more broad, you can say. And what's the difference between fellowship, or is fellowship a strategic term to include churches and congregations and synagogues, or, or does fellowship mean something yes. more informal? What, what do you mean by it? Yeah, so with, with fellowship, we are trying to uh, cover, as you said, both regular churches, but also Mm -hmm. uh, congregations that don't like the term, uh, you know, church. They like Mm -hmm. kehila or kehilot. But we're also trying to uh, explore the smaller house groups or home groups Mm. that exist. So it's a it's a it's a way of trying to, yeah. Tell the audience what what kehila and kehilot is and how that different is different from a church or what what does that mean? So so kehila means fellowship or fellow kehilot fellowships, uh, uh, community you can say. So that's the preferred Mm -hmm. term uh, for the uh, messianic congregations here that they Mm. call them congregations kehila. So they don't use the word Beit Knesset, for example. I have Uh, no idea. Do they? So so, uh, a few would use the word. Those there are that are leaning towards synagogue life and synagogue lifestyle mm-hmm. could use the term uh, Beit Knesset. Mm-hmm. And Beit Knesset, but, in, for those who don't know, is just house of gathering, but that's the Hebrew for synagogue. Actually, Greek means syn- from the Greek synagogos is to gather, and so it really is a translation of Knesset. Uh, um, when it's interesting why we have that term in Judaism, right? It's mm. probably comes from the idea that the temple in Jerusalem is referred to as Beit Tefillah, the house of prayer for all nations, for example, in Isaiah. And so there was this uh, resistance to call a place where you gathered to pray, Beit Tefillah, because that's the temple, yeah. right? So they, I presume that's the reason it was called Beit uh, Knesset in ancient Judaism or synagogos in Greek. So, for okay, so you're the pastor of the Danish congregation of the Lutheran Church in Jerusalem. Is that included in the survey? It is. Okay. Uh, so we are trying to look at mostly the evangelical world uh, within mm-hmm. Israel, and so now you said it was a Lutheran church, it's a Lutheran evangelical church, okay, uh, congregation. So uh, uh, we're trying to look at the ev- Protestant world, you can say, but not only we do include seven Catholic Messianic fellowships. What is uh, a Catholic Messianic fellowship? I've never heard of that. So they are uh, there are seven congregations in Israel that yeah. uh, are Catholics and adhere to, you know, to the Catholic theology and everything like this, but they mm-hmm. are, uh, has a Jewish or Jewish Israeli uh, expression or sort of the, the service would be in Hebrew, for example, and wow. the prayers would be in Hebrew and they will take in a few of the Hebrew traditions. Uh, they used to be now, not any longer, but they used to be led by a, a South African Jesuit Messianic believer, so uh, his his family, his Jewish, uh, halakhically speaking, uh-huh. and uh, his parents. So by, fled by the Jewish Holocaust. law, you're saying he he's uh, his mother is Jewish and her mother yes. is Jewish. Yes. And so, wait a minute, I have to wrap my head around this. So he's was born in South Africa. He's an Israeli citizen, I presume. Yes. He's a Jesuit, which is um, uh, a Catholic. I want to say monastic order, but I might not be using the terms correctly. I don't know. Um, I think the current Pope Francis is a Jesuit. Am I wrong about that? I, if I'm, I think that's grace. Um, and um, and so he used to be the head of this congregation. So, so are most of the people? So help me understand: are most of the people in this congregation Jewish, and they were raised Catholic, or are they Jews who somehow felt uh, um, d- drawn to the Catholic faith? I, or do you know the answer to that? So that is both. Some both, of them, okay. yeah, some of them are, mm-hmm. are, have Jewish mm-hmm. parents, are born in Israel and raised as Catholics, mm-hmm. and others has been raised as secular Jews or, mm-hmm. and then come to, uh, you know, join the Catholic faith. Now, now they are 
we did survey them, but we kind of keep them outside of our, of all our when we talk about the messianic movement. Mm. We, we separate these seven congregations from the rest because they're not the same, okay. and the okay. other and the other messianic movement do not want to identify themselves with the Catholic Church at all. That's really interesting. I had these friends who who spent a year in Israel, and they're not uh, of Jewish heritage. And they were, um, I guess you could describe them as uh, non-Jews who believed in Yeshua and wanted to keep the Torah. And they were living up in Poria, which is a place that has a lot of Messianics. And um, and they, they explained to their landlord that they believe in Yeshua. And he says, oh, Katholim, Catholics. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what? No, Catholics aren't even Christians. We have nothing to do with them. But yeah. in the mind of most Israelis, I think, or most Jews... If I'm, I think most Jews look at Christianity as Catholicism, and yeah, there's this little like rebellious daughter, the the Protestants, but they don't realize. Like my mother-in-law, for example, who is a, a lifelong Protestant, doesn't consider Catholics to be Christians, no, right? And they have nothing to do with Christianity, according to her. Um, so, so you kept them separate, okay? Yeah, because you will find the same notion within the Messianic mm -hmm. body. Now, we didn't ask them about Catholicism mm -hmm. because that's outside of the scope of the survey. But okay. you you will find the same notion in most of the Messianic congregations that they do not consider the Catholics to be Christian okay. or to be believers. So, okay. Oh, well, that's interesting. So now you corrected yourself. Do they consider themselves to be Christian, most of the Messianics? So that's also a very good question. And uh, about now, I'll just round up the numbers for, for the sake of you know, yeah. clarity. And this doesn't so, include uh, the seven Catholic congregations that you're no. talking about now? Okay. No. Right. But 95% of the Messianic movement in Israel will not use the term Christian. Mm -hmm. so only yeah. about 5% are mm -hmm. comfortable with calling themselves Christians. Wow. The West do not like the term because it is, it is uh, in Israel, it's, it's like uh, going over to the enemy, maybe, or it's, there is a, mm -hmm. the worst thing you can do as a Jew. Has become a Christian. So that's the view for many people. Okay. So when they, so for them, they, 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 and there are also a few theological differences for some of them that, uh, that makes it uh, difficult to say that they're Christian in a traditional sense, at least. Okay. I want you to save that because I want to ask you about, you use the word believers. You said first, I think you said Christians and then believers, or I don't remember exactly what you said, but it's really interesting. So, um, uh, so you said 95% don't, uh, call themselves Christians. Um, you said they don't use the word Christians or they would actually reject the term Christian. So, uh, we did, uh, we did a survey where we asked, uh, the congregants, what terms do they, are they comfortable with, okay, you know, of, of, with, you know, uh, expressing mm -hmm. themselves with, and, uh, and, uh, 95% did not, did not, were not comfortable with the term Christian. They're not comfortable with the term Christian. Okay. So you use the term believer, and and uh, I lived in Israel for 20 years, and the word ma'amin uh, is thrown around in Israeli culture, uh, usually in my experience, and, and I, I'm, I'm guessing your experience might be a bit different, but in my experience, ma'amin is somebody who believes in God, but isn't orthodox, right? They'll say lodati. Yes. Uh, and it would never occur to most Israelis that ma'amin, believer, has anything to do with, with Jesus or Yeshua or Christianity. Whereas so in the Christian the, world, believer is you believe in Jesus or you yeah, should. So, so in Israel, mm -hmm. they would do the, and if they speak Hebrew, yeah, they will see a name in be Yeshua. Ah, so they have to add be Yeshua in Yeshua. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay. Well, wow, that's really interesting. So you said 95% are not comfortable calling themselves Christians. Um, is there, so do they, what do they call themselves in Hebrew? And then how does that translate, let's say into English? So they will have uh, they will have different terms that they're comfortable with. They will say mm -hmm. Jewish believers, or mm -hmm. uh, a messianic, or messianic believer, or messianic believer in Jesus. All these mm -hmm. kind of different terms that we are a follower of Jesus, Talmudim mm -hmm. uh, be Yeshua, or things mm -hmm. like this. So they will. The Talmudim be Yeshua is is disciples in Yeshua or of Yeshua. Yes. Okay. So they okay. they have a lot of different a uh, lot of different terms that they can use. Uh, mm -hmm that they're comfortable with, whereas none of them is using the word Christian. I mean, from both parts. Right. Well, of the 95%. Well, that's really yeah. interesting. So talk to us a little bit about these demographics, because, 
you know, I, I, I think a lot of people, um, well, th there's a lot of rumor that, that, that goes around about the number of, um, again, I don't even know what the term is. Jesus believing Israelis that exist. And you actually did statistics. Actually, before you give us the numbers, tell us, how did you get these numbers? So, so uh, uh, first of all, it's important that I do not claim to know how many Jewish believers in Jesus exists in mm -hmm. Israel. We will get to that in a moment because okay. there, are, there are secret believers. And I talked with a few of these that are not part of a congregation and that sits at home alone. And we can talk about that in a moment. But mm -hmm. uh, what we did was that we tracked down all fellowships of uh, Messianic fellowship and Protestant fellowships in Israel that we possibly could. Uh, so all known fellowships, we tracked down and we talked with them. And we interviewed the pastor or an elder. If, uh, if there was one congregation that did not want to participate, uh, there was 5% of the congregations did not want to participate in the survey. Oh, wow. Which is, which is not many, but still some. Uh, we would uh, visit the congregation or we will get some information in, uh, in other ways, but then we will keep them, try and keep them anonymous so they wouldn't be able to be tracked down unless they were public entities anyway. So what do you mean they didn't want to participate? You mean the pastor didn't or? Yes, or... the pastor said, there could be different reasons, but most of the times he said they didn't see the value in in such surveys or in statistics mm -hmm. or in things like this and they didn't want to spend the time on it that was the most for those okay. five percent that was fair some, enough. yeah yeah that's fair enough yeah so we, so you went and visited those congregations to try to collect some data is what you're saying yes exactly and okay. looked if they were public we would look at their websites mm -hmm. and we would look okay. at their statements of faith and things like this to find out you know okay what, and how many congregations or kihilot or whatever the term is how fellowships how many were there so we found uh, 280. Wow, okay. Uh, across all, uh, all uh, seven of them we know exists. Uh, we have been, they've been verified to us, but we have not, we didn't get the name of the pastor or their location. Just someone hmm. uh, we were, you know, so seven congregations were verifiable in existence, but we couldn't get hold of them. So they were very, um, uh, you know, is that because they're 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 trying to avoid um, being exposed? Like you talked about secret believers, or is yeah. it because, like you said, maybe the guy has a full time job and he does this on the weekend and he doesn't have time for you? What, what, what most was most the of these most of these cases would be uh, because they want to keep a very low profile. Okay. So so for those who who are listening to this or watching this and don't know, why would they want to keep a low profile and and, or maybe save that for when we get to, no, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to the secret believers, but tell us, why would they want to keep a low profile? Let's so assume I, somebody knows nothing. Okay, so as I said before, right, that uh, there are, uh, one of the worst things you can do for many Jewish people in their minds is to become a believer that Jesus is the Messiah. So therefore, there is also a lot of opposition, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we have uh, different they are called anti-missionary organizations that try to convince Jews not to believe that Jesus are the Jewish Messiah. And they can be very aggressive. So we did ask about this and some of the congregations have had terrible experiences with, uh, you know, uh, attacks and bombs and knife attacks and and, uh, okay, so you said two way different things that I got to break down. You said there's and you call them anti-missionaries who try to convince people not to believe in Yeshua. And then yes. you talk about bombs and knives. That that yeah. sounds like something qualitatively different. Am I wrong? Or is that, or is that the same thing? That, well, they, so they, uh, sometimes it's difficult to know exactly who's behind some of these attacks. Uh, but it is clear that there are, you know, one thing is convincing people not to believe in Jesus, in Jesus, in Yeshua. And mm -hmm. another side is, trying to uh, destroy those congregations or Jewish believers that already exists. And now, you mean physically yeah. destroy? What do you mean by yes, destroy? Physic yeah, yeah, in any let, way let, possible. Let, like like yeah. say there was a, in, in, uh, about 10 years ago, I think it is, there was mm -hmm. a, a rally back in Eshtot where uh, one of the rabbis there said that the Hitler and Haman wanted to destroy the 
the uh, the Jews mm-hmm. physically, but the Messianic Jews want to destroy our soul. You know, I I actually was doing an interview with a man from China, uh, and and I was sitting in a park. I didn't have anywhere to do it, so we we're literally sitting in a park in Jerusalem. This is on video somewhere on the internet, and and he says, "Do you believe that Yeshua was a, a rabbi?" And I started to give my answer, my perspective on it. And there was this person standing there and he gets creeps closer and closer. And I'm not a messianic. I'm not a Christian, right? I'm a Karite Jew, but I'm talking um, as a philologist about what I understand from the New Testament. And he starts to, and he's then in the camera and he starts to yell, pointing at me, at me. He says, this man is worse than Hitler. Hitler wanted to destroy our bodies. This man wants to destroy our soul. And I don't think this man was at the rally in Ashdod, right? No. This is something that's out there in the culture that's floating around. And I said, you don't even know anything about me. <laughs> like, you're making a lot of assumptions. Um, and, but, so, so let's talk, let's try to, let's break that down. And I don't know if you can, because, you know, you're, you're the, the Danish, you're actually Danish, right? Yes. You, so you're, you're a Danish uh, evangelical Lutheran pastor but help me try to break it down. What is going through the mind of someone who says, because uh, he assumed I was a Messianic Jew, uh, why do they think that a Messianic Jew is worse than Hitler and wants to destroy the soul of the Jewish nation? What, what are the, what's the thought behind that? So there's a lot to unpack there. I don't think we have the time to re- really dive into it. But the, in my understanding, uh, there has been what we can call the push and a pull from the very beginning since the first century, uh, push uh, out of the synagogues and for from the Jewish believers and a pull from the Gentile believers to pull out the Jewish believers from the synagogues. So that's been a, a, a trend throughout church history. And mm-hmm. church history has not been nice to the Jewish people. Okay. We don't have to look very, I mean, already in the second century and third century, there begin to be anti-Semitism within the church. And uh, and there begins to be ideas of the Jew uh, as a wandering Jew uh, and things like this, and it is escalated to burning their synagogues and uh, mm. killing them off and blood libels and all kinds of crazy stuff. So that of course creates a very bad attitude toward what it means to be Christian. Now, for mm. many Christians, the cross is a symbol of mercy and is a symbol of God's faithfulness. For many Jews. The cross is a symbol of persecution and death. Mm-hmm. So, so, and and a loss you can say of Jewish identity because one of through church history a lot of the things that were required for a Jew if they became believers because there's always been Jewish believers in Jesus. One of the things that were required for many of them was that they renounced their Jewish identity. It was a sin to be a Jew, so they had to renounce. Mm-hmm their Jewish identity and everything Jewish. They had to have their holiday on Sunday and not on Shabbat and all these things, which is trying to suffocate, you can say, the Jewishness uh, within the the Christian faith. So I think this is some of the background, you know, back curtain for, for what's going on here. Through centuries and centuries, this has been cultivated both within the Christian societies and also within the Jewish societies that the Christians want to kill us off. So now we are in a different situation. Now we have, a, you know, have the groups movement and all kinds of other things. Christians who want to be more Jewish, uh, Gentiles who want to be more Jewish because of Jesus. But uh, but I think that uh, this uh, collective awareness, you can say, in, in the Jewish society still persists. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. I don't know if that answered your questions at all. No, but I, think- I think that was a very uh, good. I think there's two aspects to, and and you know, I I want to hear what you have to say. So I'm going to kind of keep my opinions to myself as much as possible here. But but I, I would say there's two aspects here. One is what, exactly what you said. There's this visceral reaction to Jews that, uh, and and the, the the clearest image of this is I grew up in Chicago at the Art Institute of Chicago. At least when I was a kid, I don't know if it's still there. There was this Chagall. And the Chagall shows the pogroms and it shows a Jew with a talit on a cross. Mm. And the, and the message of the Chagall is that what was done to Jesus 2000 years ago was done to the Jews in the 19th and the 20th century. And it was done in the name of the cross or through the people who believe in the cross. Right. Um, Mm. That's what Chagall I think was trying to express. And I remember seeing that uh, I saw that probably 
uh, 40 years ago, and I still remember it. It had a very powerful impact on me. And so I think there's this visceral response. So if a Jew becomes a Buddhist, nobody really cares. Um, but if a Jew, um, and if a Jew becomes a Christian, they don't, I don't know if they care that much either, but if they become a messianic, it's kind of seen as this fifth column as this, um, as you know, I mean, you know, as well as I do. Right. Um, but I'm explaining to the audience, it's seen as, as, um, uh, well, I'll tell you the way my father's rabbi once said, and he wasn't talking about, about messianics. He was talking in general. He said, your worst enemy is the one who wears your uniform because you can't identify him. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. It, it, it raises all kinds of um, thoughts for me about some of the issues we have in American culture right now related to um, gender, for example, which I won't go into, but um, I think there's some of the s same issues going on there. So, so let, let's go back to rallies. So you mentioned how there's rallies and I've seen videos of, I think in Arad in Southern Israel where they're protesting, um, but still w would you, agree that that's qualitatively differently than planting bombs like that. I mean, rallies, I mean, planting, I mean it's harassing bombs. people is one thing to a rally, but planting bombs, that's, I mean, that's terrorism. That, yes. So of course that's only one congregation that had experienced a bomb plane planted that mm -hmm. almost killed uh, the pastor's son. Um, but, uh, but there's been several nice attacks. So of course there's a difference in what you say and then the action you do. Yeah, uh, there is a difference, but inciting to violence mm -hmm. is uh, what you know. Many messianics are afraid that uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that it could happen. You know, they're, they're, so and the they bomb incident. In. So let's talk about the bomb incident. Okay, is that the one where it was on um, Purim or something? Correct. Uh, yes. So that guy was a mentally ill terrorist who also uh, shot um, uh, a bunch of Arabs. And he, I think he planted a bomb at a, at a gay nightclub or something like this, if I'm not, Many if I'm things. remembering correctly. So yes. this guy was a legitimate mentally ill terrorist who had smuggled weapons into, from Florida when he uh, made Aliyah. I don't think that represents, I don't know if it's fair to say, but I understand the fear that's, that's created there, right? Yeah, but in I, some I, respects, it's, it's not fair to compare that to the guy who's having a rally saying that they're destroying our souls, which, you know, it's kind of obnoxious. But it's really different than planting a bomb, which is, I mean, you know. So, is, as I, I said before, also, I, I, it's difficult to say who's behind what, right? So I didn't okay. want to say that it's what the guys in the rallies or the anti-missionary mm. organizations that okay. planted the ball. But it, but it's all part of the same, uh, you know, collective experiences of the messianic body here. Right. So uh, if you're sitting in the pews. All you know is the bomb was planted and the guy who's out there who's protesting and, and um, uh, you know, you from your perspective, harassing your, your congregation that you don't know, is he the guy who plants the bomb or not? So it's kind of this uncertainty. That, that's and why also, when people... Yeah. And also, so, uh, you know, we have uh, combined with the knives attacks. So you have... Uh, so I don't uh, know about the knives attacks. Tell us about so I literally don't know about that. What's that? It happens quite a lot. I'm not, I mean, compared comparative quite a lot, you mm -hmm. know, compared to Christians in Denmark, at least, right? We are not attacked by knives at all. Uh, okay. But uh, but uh, you'll have, you'd have, for example, 2017, there was a, a release of a new Messianic CD from one of the congregations mm -hmm. with songs. And for that, there was an Orthodox organization showing up uh, a mm -hmm. bunch of people uh, with knives that made the... Uh, the police flee the scene and and call in mm. a SWAT team to kind of wow. protect the congregation. So, uh, so yeah. and like there are that's definitely, just one example. Yeah. So there are definitely so, incidents of violence, and, and, I, and I want to acknowledge that. There was one case in Mea Shalim a number of years back, and it must have been over 10 years ago, I think, where like there were these two nuns or something who were um, living in, in the ultra-Orthodox neighborhood in Jerusalem, and I guess the belief was that they were there for missionary purposes, and what I read in the newspaper, at least, is is a mob descent, uh, descended on their apartment and and burned it, and they had to be removed from the apartment by us by the police uh, so, to barely so save their lives. Do you know about this incident? Or I, I no, not so much because I mean okay. I heard of it, but it's uh, okay. they were nuns, so they were outside of you know. Okay. The, 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 so, the so, so there is legitimate but, reason for fear there, and so, so I understand what you're saying about the they don't want to be identified. Some of the congregations. 
Exactly. But I have to say that the most congregations also, uh, we asked, there's a difference of the language spoken also, what, how mm-hmm. much severity of the harassment they experience. But uh, of the Hebrew speaking congregations, 40% ex- has experienced in the past 15 years some sort of uh, severe harassment. So okay. borderline wow. illegal or, uh, mm-hmm. or, you know, like the bomb. But it, but most of the congregations that would be sixty percent or forty percent if we you know have either mild or no experiences of harassment they can mm-hmm. they can uh, they they live freely express their faith as they want to with no problems whatsoever. Mm-hmm. So it probably so depends that, where they're located as well. I would imagine if they're in Tel Aviv, nobody bothers them. If they're apparently in Arad, they harass people. I don't know yeah. why in a rod and it sounds like Ashdod has some problems too. So yes. um, I would get, I would guess, and here I want to be really careful, but if I had a guess from what you've said and what I've heard, it has to do with the proximity to maybe ultra Orthodox communities. Would that be, do you think that make, is that correct? Or you don't know? Um, I will put it this way. It is absolutely correct that it also happens within close proximity of ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods. Oh, but not only. But not only. Oh, okay. That's, I didn't know that. All right, so tell us about some of these statistics before we get to the, the juicy part, which is the secret believers. <laughs> that, that, that's what we want to get to. But we, let, first, let's find out what the... Because that that's almost like the seven Catholic congregations, in a sense. I'm getting the impression that it's, it's, it's in a sense, it's, um, it's, not, it's not the most common phenomenon, right? It's not the most common thing. Is that right? Or, or you guess you don't know no, if they're secret. No. Are you asking about the secret believers? Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's difficult. I mean, that's difficult to count. There are other organizations mm. uh, that uh, have a lot of contact with people sitting behind their computers or, mm. and, and, and Googling about Yeshua in Hebrew and, or, okay. you know, and they're interacting with them. But it's difficult to know what counts as a believer, right? Do you need to be baptized ah. to be a believer or do you need to be part of a congregation? Or can you sit at home, have some thoughts about, okay, maybe Jesus is the Messiah, but the, it won't change my life. So, it won't. so let, let's save that for the secret believer con- uh, yeah. uh, discussion, which I want to get to. Tell me about what the more, um, let's say, open phenomenon is that you were able to document. I want you to share the screen if you can and share some of the statistics that you shared at the World Congress of Jewish Studies because... You know, I'd heard about for decades about, you know, there's uh, all these Messianic congregations in Israel. And but what do we really know? And you actually know stuff. It's incredible. Yes. So. uh, Oh. And that's the book that people can get. uh, Is that available on Amazon? It's available on Amazon as a Kindle. And uh, then it's available on the, the website. Okay. And what's the website? Caspire.com. Uh, okay, beautiful. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so now, uh, I mean, it's it will take a lot of time to go through all the uh, the nitty grits of the it, scope and things it, like it, this. But one thing that mm-hmm. is important for me to say some of our limitations, and this okay. we did not survey what we can call immigrant churches. Okay. We quickly find out found out there are about at least, for example, thirty five. African immigrant churches in Tel Aviv only. But there are what does no... that mean, immigrant churches? What, what do you mean? So by this, I mean, uh, I mean people that uh, are in Israel, you know, because they're working. Or uh, they, ah. uh, they have sought asylum, or they are, you know, there are many Nigerian fellowships or, or fellowships from Uganda or really? all kinds of fellowships. Many African fellowships, yeah. But okay. we've quickly found out that there are no... Jewish believers in them there are no Jews in these kind of in these churches. They are all okay. connected to the to the country they come from, and they don't and self-identify. I, I'm assuming as Messianic or Hebrew no. or anyway. Okay. No, no, they identify with the churches back in their home country. Okay, yeah, and we don't include Arab churches, and we did not serve a Messianic ministries. So Ooh. we have focused yeah. on the. Congregations. Our assumption is okay. if you're a messianic ministry and a CEO of one of these, you will still be part of a congregation. I see. What would be an example of a messianic ministry that wouldn't be included, just so I, I can understand? Um, a messianic ministry? You don't have to name it, but just what, what, it, what would it look like? 
It could be a, a, a ministry, for, for example, working in tourism. Okay, I see. Yeah. Or it could so, be. Uh, okay, so you're saying, or let's say, like you've got that uh, group. Um, and I won't name them, but there's the group that like targets uh, is Israelis, and they say we're the native Israelis who believe in Yeshua. So your assumption is those people are part of a congregation somewhere, and so you don't look at that ministry. Yes. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. That helps understand. All right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we, yeah. So different things we did. We so what we did was that we interviewed. We found out all these pastors first. We went around asking some of the local mm -hmm. pastors and leaders, "Are you at all interested in this kind of survey?" And mm -hmm. most of the pastors we asked before we began said, "Yes, please do this survey for us." Oh wow. So, uh, so we got uh, uh, help from some of the local pastors. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we uh, we went out and asked the pastors, you know, how many congregations are in your city and what are the names of the congregations and of the pastors and of the mm -hmm. elders. And then we asked that, that question, we asked all pastors. And that way we came out more and more to all the congregations. There were also some of some official directories of congregations that we used to check up if the pastors were still there, all these kind of things. So when all that was done, was done, we took, we interviewed every pastor for about an hour or an hour and a half with different questions. Mm -hmm. So this is the questions that uh, in the areas of uh, what we ask, the fellowship's history, the numbers of individuals, including how many are Jews and non-Jews. So that's a demographic breakdown under 18, over 18 family stages, countries of birth, all these kinds of things. We ask oh, about wow. theology, ministry, main service and life, how this we looked into. So you talked about the spectrum, right? So we would ask yeah. them, where are you on the Judaism Christianity spectrum? Right. Okay. Um, and oh, uh, we asked that's really about interesting. Okay. the views of the state of Israel and army service, if they had any denominational affiliates, uh, views of the charismatic gifts, if they're charismatic or not, the theology of communion, what they thought Jesus was, uh, if, uh, you know, if they practiced halakha, the view of women, if they're harassed, you know, finances, connectedness, statements of faith, main language, all these kinds of things. So these are the questions we we, we surveyed mm -hmm. uh, for the pastors. When we did that, after that, we sent out an online survey for to all the pastors to send around to their congregants mm -hmm. and to get them to answer, to see if the congregants had the same idea as the pastors of their own congregations. Mm. So that was very interesting to to see. Wow, that is interesting. Would the would the pastor see the results, or would that go directly to you? No, that would go directly to us. So that's it. So so uh, it's 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 like almost like a secret ballot. So uh, I don't want to jump ahead, but I want to know the answer. <laughs> so I do want to jump ahead. How different was the views of the con? Uh, and well, let's just save this as a thought. W w were they substantially different? The views of the congregants versus the the pastor? No. No, they weren't. Okay. All right. So I guess that's that's the answer. <laughs> no, they weren't. Okay. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, were, were they substantially different from one another? Uh, yes. That could be very okay. big differences. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll talk about some of those. All right. So what do we have here? Congregation versus house groups. What does yeah, that so, mean? So we, uh, we interviewed representatives of 273 congregations. So that mm -hmm. would be excluding the seven congregations that we know exist or fellowship we know exists, but we did, couldn't get hold of. Okay. And then we uh, people were asking us, you know, how big are the congregations? Are there a house group or are there a congregation? Things like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we decided, so this is just a breakdown. You can see at the sizes, if they are more than 20 people, we considered it a congregation. Okay. And if they were less than 20 people, we considered it a house group. Okay. So that's the breakdown of that. So that we found mm. 197 congregations above 20 people inside the mm. congregation and 76 congregate, uh, fellowships that were less than 20. And this is all over Israel? This is all over Israel. One interesting thing, we'll see if we have time to go to that, is that they are spread out equally, almost equally in all six districts of Israel. Mm. Okay. So they, so they are as many in the south as there are in Tel Aviv. Wow, that's interesting. Even though there's a lot more people in Tel Aviv. Yes. That is interesting. Okay. All right. Yeah, so that's what that is. 
And uh, we also found out this might surprise a lot of people that because when we think about a Messianic congregation in Israel, we tend to believe that the main language is Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And we found here that actually 136 out of these 273 congregations were Russian speaking. Wow. So that's uh, that wow. is uh, that's a lot. Romanian. 30, 30 were Romanian? No. Two were Romanian. Oh, oh, oh were, okay. Oh, yeah. what was that? Oh, Amharic. Oh, Amharic, Amharic is the yeah. Ethiopian language. Yes. Okay. Wow. So, oh, and only 16 were English. That surprises me. I would have thought more. Um, yeah. But I, I guess I'm wrong. Um, okay. That's really interesting. So, so tell me how this comes about, if you know, that you have 136 that are Russian-speaking um, that I think I know the answer to. I don't know the answer to the Romanian or the um, Spanish. That's a bit surprising to me. So, uh, well, it might not be as surprising as you think, but uh, of course, the Russian speakers that has that has to do with the uh, the influx of Russian speakers in the eighties and nineties mm -hmm. and the early two thousands. There were okay. different time periods where there were a great influx of of Russians with the Jewish heritage. Mm -hmm. moving to Israel. So and, let, let's uh, put that in context. So the current population of Israel, I want to say in 2022, is something like 9 million, is it including? About 9.5, I think. In okay. 2020, and, it was 9.2. Yeah. Okay, so, and, and over 1 million uh, people immigrated to Israel from the former Soviet Union just in the 90s, just in the early 90s, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, so, have, so over ten percent of the population was born in the Soviet Union. We have um, one point one point three uh, percent mm. are Russian speakers from the former Soviet Union. Yeah, uh, one not point, one point three million. One point three million. So yeah. that's more than ten percent today were born in the Soviet Union, and their native language was presumably Russian or they you know, maybe speak was, Russian at least. They could speak right, maybe it's Ukrainian or or Bukharan yes. or something, but they also speak Russian. Okay. Yeah. So their their services will not be in Ukrainian, for example, even right. though they would be oh, Ukrainian. Okay. It would be in Russian. Okay. All right. Interesting. Wow. And okay. for the Sp and for the yeah. Spanish speakers, they are yeah. mostly from South America. Okay. And that has to do with the Second World War, where many Jews fled from mm -hmm. uh, from Europe. And they they fled to uh, South South America, uh, mm -hmm. where they where so their children grew up with the Spanish language. And what about the Amharic? So, so so what is so? Let me ask this question: What percentage of the Israeli population is of Ethiopian descent, and are they disproportionately uh, represented here? Yes, I am uncertain actually how many. Uh, on the top of my head, I cannot say how many are uh, Ethiopian. In the total population, okay. Um, but there were also uh, so these are what you can say a part of what is called Beta Israel. Yeah. Some might know them as Felasha Jews. Yeah, we don't use that term anymore. The Ethiopian exactly. Jews. Exactly. So, yeah. so they they don't they see that as a mm -hmm. derogatory term, so they like mm -hmm. to call themselves Beta Israel. Right. Uh, so, so these thirty congregations they are they are all part of the Beta Israel. Right. They okay. are the the uh, the you might surprise you also, but they are the the uh, congregation, uh, you can say subgroup with the mm -hmm. most percentage of halakhically Jews within them. So I want you to say that again because that's kind of a uh, that's an impressive that well, that um, that opens up a lot of kind of more. So so say that again. So the Ethiopian congregations are the subgroup. Where within you have the most halakhically Jewish members. So, so what you're saying is, if I'm understanding correctly, um, not everyone in these congregations is considered Jewish halakhically, meaning by by rabbinical law, which yes. might mean they have a father who's Jewish, or their father's yes. father was Jewish, and the rabbis wouldn't consider them. The Orthodox rabbis wouldn't consider them Jewish. Um, would there be people in these congregations who have no Jewish ancestry? Yes. Okay. And so the Ethiopian segment here is um, has the largest percentage of halakhic Jews. That's really interesting. So I just looked it up. According to Google, take that with a grain of salt, there's about <laughs> 160,000 Ethiopian Jews in Israel. And you said the population is 9.5 million. So that would put them at 
around, let's call it 2%, right? 1.7% or something of the Jew, of the Israeli population. So that also includes Arabs. And then here we have them at, um, what is the percentage here, at least of the congregations? And I guess this is a bit, mis might be misleading because maybe the congregation is 20 people. Um, yes. I'm doing the math here. So, oh, so 273. So 30 divided by 273. So 11% are Ethiopian or Amharic speaking at least even though they only represent 2% um, of the Israeli population. That's really interesting. How do you, um, how do you explain that? I think uh, it's, without knowing it specifically, I think it's mm. the same dynamic that goes on with the Russian speakers. So you have these large groups of immigrants coming in, making mm -hmm. Aliyah, yeah. both from Russia, and also you have especially, you know, uh, um, uh, what's the Project Solomon and, and Moses, Operation Moses right. and Operation Solomon, right. bringing in the, the Beta Israel, where they have large mm -hmm. groups of uh, uh, coming in at the same time. Okay. And uh, they come to a new country. They mm -hmm. might not know anybody, and they are either fleeing, mm -hmm. fleeing from something or they are pursuing a better life here in mm -hmm. Israel. And they're trying to find out what does it mean to live in Israel. So why okay. they are here, they they meet the stories of Jesus in a new way, and then they are, are more prone, I guess, to come to 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 think, okay, maybe Jesus can be a Jewish Messiah as well, and then they look into that possibility. Whereas, mm -hmm. if you are born in the country, that's a much larger step to take, I think. It's interesting because in Ethiopia, the Jews were persecuted by Christians. Yes. Um, and not like in some ancient time in up until the, uh, in the 20th century. Yes. And and maybe there are still some that are persecuted with Christians. I but don't I know. think it has to do with the uprooting that you mm -hmm. when you when you're uprooted, you know, your whole life is up in the air anyway. So do you have any information about how these um, Messianic Jewish Messianic Ethiopian Jews view the Ethiopian uh, Christian church? Uh, what is it called? The Ethiopian Orthodox Church or something? So there are, there are yes, there is an Ethiopian Orthodox Church, but there are also uh, Pentecostal churches oh, in, really? uh, in Ethiopia. Okay. Uh, a strong Pentecostal church in Ethiopia. Really? And uh, okay. none of these Ethiopian congregation in Israel have any connection with the Orthodox Church. Wow. So but they, they are... Connection to the Pentecostal Church? Yes, they are all charismatic. Now that doesn't have to be a formal uh, relationship with the you know some do but most don't with the churches in Ethiopia but mm. they are all charismatic. Wow! So I want I want to save that question about charismatic because I want you to share some of the other stuff. But I already wrote that down. Uh, I wrote down three questions I want to get to, and that's from your survey: charismatic gifts, holy communion, and deity of Jesus Yeshua. Those were three of your mm. questions. Mm -hmm. I hope we'll have time to get to that, but I want you to continue because this is fascinating. This, this is amazing. It, this is so fascinating to me because I've been hearing rumors for decades and, and nobody really knows anything. And and here you actually have data, which is pretty cool. Yes. Yeah. And, and you so, did this as a, as a scientific study, right? Am I right about that? Yes. Yes. That is that is what okay. we had tried to adhere to, to, to be okay. very strict in our approaches and, and right. always giving sources for where we have it and... I've been reading a lot also. Uh, mm. but uh, I, I want to emphasize that because <clears throat> I think a lot of people I've heard personally who are talking about how many Messianic Jews are in Israel, um, it's part of a fundraising strategy. Um, and here you're doing this scientifically. Yes. Right? You're, you're not saying this, oh, we need a lot of money here for the Messianics in Israel because there's so many of them and they need support or something, which is what I've heard, right? Um, you're actually doing this as, as, as science. That's pretty cool, as objective yeah. research. All right, which is why it was at the World Congress of Jewish Studies. Yeah, that's why I presented it there, of course. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. but also you can say now it's not only being used, numbers here are, uh, are not only being used by the uh, Messianic ministries and things like this, it's also being used uh, for the anti missionary organizations. Uh oh. <laughs> so, right. is this backfiring? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. But uh, it's just mm -hmm. to say that they also have been used inflating numbers because see oh, how they have. They, yeah, yeah. See how big the threat oh, is. Oh, oh! I hadn't thought of that. Oh, I see. So this hurts them in a way. You're saying is that? I don't know. I don't know if they, I don't think it hurts them. I think they. Oh, uh, or it helps uh, them. I don't. Know. 
maybe uh, you know but i think most of the information we provide here they they already know i mean for each congregation maybe they don't have the statistics uh-huh. now they but they will know most congregations anyway I see. So they're keeping track of who these congregations are for their own purposes. They do. And they probably have their own database or something. Okay. Gotcha. All right. All right. Let's, um, l- l- let's see what else you got. This is, uh, so a typical, typical Kehillah. Kehillah. Yeah. I think it will be people who might be interested in what that means. So we see yeah. most of the congregations are Namuta, which means they are non registered, uh, non profit, registered non profit organization in Israel. That's the equivalent in the United States of what we call a 501c3, or in, or in England they, or the United Kingdom, they call that a charity. All right? Yes. So it's they are kind of for charity, yes, in that sense. So they, mm-hmm. most of the congregations will be in Amuta and registered in some way or other. Mm-hmm. Some way or another. They do not own their building. Okay. I mean, so this is just general. Most, so of course, some congregations are not in Amuta and other congregations mm-hmm. do own their buildings, but mm-hmm. the typical congregations do mm-hmm. not. Wow. They are non-liturgical, which means they don't pray well from the Sidur, uh, mm. and they don't they don't use typical, what you could say, Christian liturgies in the way they uh, they they do their service. Uh, but they will eventually, you know, some sometimes they will cite the Shema Yisrael mm-hmm. or the uh, the the uh, uh, the priestly blessing. Okay. Uh, uh, things like this. Uh, What's the plus thing? two? So we got Shema, the priestly blessing. What else? What's the third one? Uh, so there's some will will might say the Lord's prayer. Okay. Uh, but that, but that's mm-hmm. very few, that's very few. Most of them will. will so be this the is Shema this, or the, yeah, or, this, this is interesting because if you go to your t- and I just had a conversation with uh, someone else for a podcast and, and we were talking about different Jewish denominations and I made the remark that every Jewish denomination is in Christian terms high church. Right? It doesn't matter if you're Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, Karite. Every one of them has, this is the liturgy. This is what you say on Shabbat. You've got to get through these pages. Yes. And and um, and then what they call in Christianity, low church. And maybe I'm misusing these terms. But it's not liturgical in the sense that you don't have a set formula that you recite when you go into the congregation each week. And you're saying most of them are non-liturgical. So, what, so I know this is... A, this is Maybe this is related to the charismatic question. What do they do at this in the kila? What do they do at the congregation? So, so uh, and it, it differs a little bit of whether or not they meet on a Friday or they meet on a Saturday. Okay. But uh, so that's a plus two, right? So the last one there would be some of them also will light the Shabbat candles. Okay. Just a Jewish tradition. So that is typically if they meet on a Friday, they will typically, you know, have a, uh, some sort of kiddush. Because uh, uh, that's when Jews do the candlelighting service. Yes, is, is on Friday night. Okay, or yes. Friday afternoon. Okay. So, but they will again. Typically, they will have a time of uh, uh, songs where they sing together. Okay. And then after that, there will be a, a message of some kind. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. after the message, either they will have another song, or they will the meeting will end. So what? If you had to compare this to uh, a type of church that my audience would be familiar with, and I probably am not familiar with, but a type of church in, in let's say, in the, the United States, what would be, this be closest to? Which, like, I like putting things in boxes because it makes me feel more comfortable. If I can yeah, I, li- I like in. to be careful with putting things in boxes. Uh, but uh, I guess um, it might, from some of the... It might be relatable to an evangelical congregation in the United States. Okay. Would that be like what they call non-denominational congregation? Uh, it doesn't not necessarily. Have, doesn't have, not necessarily, but okay. it could be like a non-denominational, but I think uh, I think uh, okay. it doesn't and need is, to be. And is that because they were influenced by these congregations from the West? Or did this happen organically, or do we have no idea? And uh, now I have to be careful. Okay. So, so one thing is, we we did ask the congregations if they had any denominational or any connectedness with uh, with denominations or streams of uh, of faith outside of Israel or within Israel. Okay. And I so it's, I want to be careful in in just saying you know no they are definitely influenced by the Americans. Definitely, some are influenced by the evangelical 
churches within America. You say they the, are. Some are. Not okay. all, some are. I, I, okay. You know, this is not a typical Kehila mission because they can vary. And some are influenced by Reformed theology. There are seven seven fellowships that, uh, that out, you know, out loud will say that they are Reformed. Now, not just, Reformed just, Judaism, but Okay, reformed. that was my question. Yeah, not so, so, reformed so Reformed Christian. does that mean Calvinism? Yeah, some sort of, yeah. They, okay. they, 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 will, they will look back to the Westminster uh a meeting in 1910 in Edinburgh also and things like this, yeah. Okay. All right. So seven of them actually self-identify that way. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And some are influenced by the Baptist and some are not influenced directly by anyone, but the pastor has connections to all kinds of different denominations and, mm-hmm. and, and fellowships outside. Now, now we are talking mainly about the Hebrew-speaking congregations because the Russian-speaking congregations, they will either be influenced uh, in an like what you can say an anti-orthodox Christian uh, approach. Now they don't want to be orthodox Christians, so that's kind of like the opposite way around. Uh, and by orthodox, the, you mean Russian orthodox? Uh, yes, Russian ortho, Christian orthodox. Yeah, in okay. all its shapes and forms. So okay. Russian orthodox, the Russian orthodox church. There is lots of anti-Semitism throughout, especially mm-hmm. in the former Soviet Union and with the pogroms. And you, you know, you mm-hmm. mentioned Chagall. So, uh, so they have a tendency to, to not want to do that. And mm-hmm. others have uh, connections to Pentecostal or Baptist churches back in, mm-hmm. in Ukraine or in, in Russia. But uh, it's okay. difficult to say how much they are influenced, but it's difficult to say how much. Mm. Okay. So you said there's no denominational marker. And this surprises me. There's no structured proselytizing. So you got to talk about that. And the reason that's important, I think, to, to, to share with the audience and it surprises me, is that the, the um, I think the reason that this rabbi in Ashdod said they're, they're, you know, Hitler wanted to destroy our bodies, they want to destroy our souls, is that the, the assumption is that the whole purpose is that this is a fifth column, they're just pretending to be Jews just to convert us. Um, this whole thing is a proselytizing endeavor, and it's, it's not an authentic expression of Judaism, but you're saying the typical kilah doesn't have any structured proselytizing. What do, tell us what that means. So, uh, first of all, of course, they would disagree with uh, what you, you know the Orthodox community is saying. The Jewish Orthodox community is saying that they are not authentically Jewish. Right? They would say we are authentically Jewish. My, mm-hmm. you know, my mother or my father was killed in the Holocaust, or my mm-hmm. grandparents fled. All these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. The second thing is they. They do believe that uh, Jesus is the Jew Messiah and do want to share that message, you can say, with their fellow Jew. Mm-hmm. But they, the most congregations do not have, a, you know, structured strategies of how are we proselytizing our neighbors. Mm-hmm. They mostly just keep to themselves. And then if, you know, they do, if people ask them on one-on-one, they will, they will share their faith and they will invite them to the Kihila, but it will mm-hmm. be more on a friendship-based style, mm-hmm. more than a, a structured. It doesn't mean that, you know, some congregations do have a structured evangelization uh, approach, but mm-hmm. most of them don't. So I think a lot of people in the U.S. are familiar with Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons who go literally knocking door to door. Is there anything like that in the Messianic Jewish movement where, uh, and and if I, if I, I could be mischaracterizing it, but I think for Jehovah's Witnesses, they have a mitzvah, right? They actually have like a, um, uh, some uh, religious um, requirement to go and evangelize or to spread, spread their, their faith. Is there something like that? I mean, basically you're saying there isn't something like that in a formal way, at least. Is that right? That's correct. I mean, all, all pastors will say, share your faith with mm-hmm. your friends. All pastors okay. will say, be open about your faith and share mm-hmm. it and, 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 yeah. and preach that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah and all these kinds of terms. Okay. But f- from that to a structured, you know, strategic uh, um, plan, on how to reach your neighbor and tell them that the Jesus is the true Messiah as a congregation, that's a long way. How does that compare to churches, let's say, in the United States, 
uh, evangelical churches, do they typically have some structured um, uh, strategy or approach to, um, and I don't know what the term is, right? Proselytizing, uh, and I think they generally target um, non-Jews, right? But right. I've like met people who like, who have like street ministries who, who, you know, who go out and they, um, you know, do different things. I met one guy who like goes out and, and, and goes to parks and fixes bikes of little, of little kids. And then while he's fixing the bikes, he like shares about Jesus. Um, I, I don't know if that's typical or not. I have no idea. Is, 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 is this typical of evangelical churches in, in, I don't know about in Denmark or the U S where they don't have a structured proselytizing or would that be atypical? Um, first of all, I think I just have to say to be very clear that the Messianic congregations in Israel are very clear on not doing any kind of proselytizing for children. Okay. Well, this if wasn't are, in, this wasn't in Israel. This was in the United in Pennsylvania. Yes. Guess, yes. Okay. So I'm, I just want to be clear that and, and he wasn't under, Messianic. He was just regular Christian. Okay. Yeah. And that's no, actually because there's an Israeli law that it's illegal to proselytize to children. Yes. So, to minors. so they okay. they do have children camps, but all parents. That uh, you know, just for their own children. But if you are an outsider, you have to, or, or even their own children, have to sign a mm. documentation that they are. They know that this is a, uh, that these you know is a messianic, uh, you know, children's camp or whatever. They're okay. very particular about not mm. proselytizing towards children at all. Okay. On any level. Okay. Now, if it's a, I, I don't know if it's atypical for a. Uh, um, uh, congregations in the states to to not have a strategy for. Uh, proselytizing, but most fellowships, even especially evangelical fellowships, will have built-in mission trips of some kind. Okay. Uh, regularly. Oh, so that so that's so that's the okay. So that's the um, the mishpetz at the uh, the the slot that's missing a sense in a sense the mission trips. Okay, so they don't have something like that. I see. No, oh, okay. they don't. Andrew, I mean, that's fascinating. In, in general, oh, wow. some might yeah. have, right? Some might have, but in general, the general yeah. picture does not show that. So, so another way that might be expressed is like a soup kitchen, I guess. Or, am I right? Is that that's how they do it in the Western world? Um, have... So in Israel, they will have a lot. The congregation will have relief work. You can say so. Okay. They will give they will give out food distributions and clothes okay. and things like this, but they will not they will not talk about Yeshua while they do it. Okay. Wow. It's, it's wow. That's fascinating. Is that is so so now I have to ask the question, is that because what is the reason for that? I mean, I want to say is that dafka? In other words, is it, it's a Hebrew word, is it or really uh Aramaic word? Is is that because they're they're specifically trying to avoid what they're accused by the Orthodox of doing? Or is it because they're afraid to do it? Or because they they just want to be left alone and do their own thing. What what is or maybe it's all of the above. What what do you think the reason is for for this? There's definitely a reason of of not being accused of buying people buying people. Okay, right? no, so I mean in a, general why they have no structured proselytizing. Oh, I thought you meant the relief work. Yeah, still mm -hmm. I think I think uh, uh, it is both due to the their relatively small numbers within the within the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and the and the the all the fears and and the, the the ideas that goes on in Israel targeting the Messianic Jews as a problematic entity, okay. uh, and therefore I think they are they are careful in how they share their faith. Can you jump ahead? And I, and I want to talk about the rest of these things, but uh, I have the list of questions. Those were some of the questions I was interested in. Jump ahead. What are the statistics? Are we talking about? You know, 500,000, are we talking about 5,000? I know the answer because I heard your lecture. But, <laughs> uh, but yes. uh, yeah, what do we got? So here we have uh, uh, the screen here where we have, mm -hmm. we've divided these groups into, you know, three different uh, groups, you can say. Mm -hmm. We have groups one through seven, that's the six districts, plus all those who want to be anonymous. And those are those mm -hmm. we call, those are the fellowships we call messianic fellowships. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have, the international groups that will be like in the Danish church or will be other uh, you know, Lutheran church and the Presbyterian churches and mm -hmm. things like this. They will, or, or the Baptist church in Israel, for example, will also be part of group eight, uh, where there are also Messianic Jews within them. And then in the end, we have all, you know, have a bit of Catholics and also, you know, 
people who are uh, has uh, either sectarian tendencies without being a sect, but has you know they are closed fellowships. You cannot come. You know, cannot be an outsider and enter into the society. They have no mm. connection to the messianic fellowship at all. Uh, they are just by themselves or have very little connection to the to, to other congregations. And they they don't uh, they can have a variety of different uh, theologies. That that's group ten that you're talking about? Yes, that's group ten. Yeah. So what would so be an have, example of that? Is that anything I would have heard of? Is it is that like some what would I, I don't know what that would be. I don't think uh, most of them you will. Uh, there is one group that uh, will be known to you, I guess. Okay. And that would be the Seventh Day Adventists. Okay. Okay. So they're so they're okay. So they're not messianic, and they're not even. So group eight is um. Where's nine? Oh, nine is the Catholics. So group is that right? Nine is the Catholics. Yeah, the so, Catholics and the okay. Orthodox Church. So we'll oh, doing. and the Orthodox Church. Yeah. So group eight is um is the international churches that are evangel evangelical and the group 10 would Protestant. be or Protestant and yeah. group 10 would be people like Seventh-day Adventists. Are they considered Christians, Seventh-day Adventists by mainstream so, Christians? Yes. With a little, uh, you know, question is, mark. Isn't there something yes. about binitarianism or uh, I don't now, know, there, are is there are issues with them and that's why they are in group 10. Okay, right. fair so, enough. Uh, and, yeah. and and you said indivi uh okay. So you said we're talking about like um and you said okay. sectarian. I, I want to understand so, that so, more. Okay, so so why is it not that interesting because we want to focus on group one through seven. Right. But Let's it, go back it, to one through seven, because it's three thousand including the Catholics. What are we talking? A few hundred people, maybe, right? I mean Yes, exactly. So I'll okay. just say I'll just say that in group ten we have you I mean, there mm -hmm. were some that are uh, very close. And have very strange ideas of what it means to be uh, a believer in Jesus. They are not Jewish, but they will be Jewish members. So they would not be messianic, okay. but they would are, that include they uh, Jehovah's Witnesses? Would they be included? In no, so, no, no. So Jehovah's Witnesses are moments we have decided not to survey because they are, they are they they are by mainstream Christianity already not considered Orthodox in their beliefs. Okay. All right. Even though okay. some of one through seven might not be orthodox. <laughs> yes, you can say so, that. But right, let's talk about one yeah. through seven because that really is yes. what interests me in, in in this context and the audience. I think. So, so, uh, so yeah. in these two hundred and seventy three congregations that mm -hmm. we surveyed, we found that their members are fifteen thousand three hundred and twenty three individuals. Okay. Children. Wait, and so groups one through seven are the, Sorry, groups one through seven are the two hundred and seventy three. Yes. So group eight is beyond the 273 that we talked yes. about before. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. So, so and, and then I, I'm not sure it's clear here in the image. So you have a dot there, but that in the U.S. would be considered like a comma. Is that right? 15,323? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, right. it's, that is not uh, 17. That is not 15 point. Right. Yeah. 15,000. That's very specific. That extra three. Like what? So this is actual data that we're looking at here. Yeah, this is the, this is what the pastors have told us. Okay, we have asked them how many are in your congregation. They say we are twenty seven members, or we are two hundred and five members, right? Okay, I see. And then and then that's what we've collected, and then we just added them up in the congregations from the two hundred and seventy three congregations. So mm -hmm. yeah, there are fifteen thousand three hundred twenty three within them, children okay. and non children and adults and Jew and Gentile, mm -hmm. everything together. Okay. So this is not the number of of, of Jewish people. This mm. is uh, the number of, that worships in a messianic fellowship, I see. Ra rather than in a, in a traditional Christian church. Okay, okay. Can we break this down into more, or do you break this down into more? Like how many are Jews? How many are yes non halachic yes. Jews? Oh, you got it there. Okay. <laughs> so, so so first of all, before okay. I go into that, it is we also yeah. ask how many are Safra. So one thing is how many are Jewish but also mm -hmm. how many are born in the country. And uh, that they could not really answer. So this is, a, 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 it's difficult to uh, extrapolate this data, but because we have it, mm -hmm. so, so few have knew it, but from mm -hmm. one we could see here. Uh, Tell us what a Sabra is. Uh, native born Israeli, okay. native born Israel. And I love the word Jew. Sabra because it actually refers to the fruit of the um, of a certain type of cactus. 
And the in reason the native yes. born Israelis are called that uh, is because it's prickly on the outside and sweet on the inside. And so that <laughs> they say that's the symbol of the native born Israeli, that they're tough and prickly, but on the inside they're sweet. Okay, sabarim or sabras are... So what am I looking at here in the numbers? Yeah, so, What's the so 180 yeah, and... Yeah, so here you have uh, you can just you can, in the different language groups how many could answer how many congregation how many sabras are in the congregations that's uh, you know in the first line the second line mm -hmm. is uh, the percentage of uh, fellowships that could actually answer that question. So it doesn't mean that's the uh, real of, number. That's just how many could answer. Uh, no, yeah. So within no. Yes, so the, for example, let's look at the uh, the uh, Amharic speaking congregations, right? Okay. You have 180 uh, uh, sabras within those congregations, mm -hmm. but but and that that is 16 percent of those fellowship that they are members of is 16 percent of those fellowships have sabras within them. Okay, let's look at the Russian because the Russian were 50 percent of the fellowships, and you're saying only three percent of the members. Or the congregants are that answered. Born. Yes, exactly. That, that answered. Of course, okay. Yeah. So, but so this, of course, relates again to the big influx of immigrants from former Soviet Union that came, right? So we Got have it. a one point three million Russian speakers in the land that have mm -hmm. immigrated here, or their parents have immigrated here, and of course, most of them are not born in the country. So again, a second or third generation Russian speakers, they become Hebrew speakers. Right. Right. So so you're saying three so percent of the people in the Russian congregations answered that they were Sabras, which would yes. mean there's something like eleven hundred and thirty Russian speaking congregants. That's really interesting because fifty percent of the congregations are Russian, but you said the total's fifteen thousand. So how are we how is that number adding up? Um so within the Russian so off the fifty percent Okay, thank you for this question. Let's just make it clear. So in the Russian congregations that are 50%, uh -huh. of those 136 congregations, in them 3% of these 136 congregations are, are sabras. Right. So if I say 3% are sabras, that means there's 1,133 people uh, approximately. So, so you don't have the number yet to exactly make that calculation, I think, because you're taking the number from 15,000. So right. you have to take no. the number from about yeah. 7,000 here. Oh, so you have uh, more specific numbers. Yeah. Okay, right. here we go. Here we go. Ah. So you have to... All right. So you have to take the number from the 16,113 that are uh, Russian-speaking. In the Russian... 6,113. Okay. I see. Okay. Oh, so that's in. Okay, this is really an important graph here. So what? So what it tells me is the Hebrew-speaking congregations have many more members yes. than the Russian-speaking yes. congregations because they have they have more people, even though the smaller fellowships or yes. a smaller number of fellowships. But you also wow. have to remember here. So this this is mm -hmm. correct within the fellowships, but if we compare with the Russian speakers. 100% or 99.9% .9 in the Russian-speaking congregations are from the former Soviet Union and speak Russian. Mm -hmm. In the Hebrew-speaking congregations, that's not the case. Right. You will they can have, speak, okay. Yeah, they can be native they, Spanish speakers or English speakers or Amharic speakers. They can be from all over the world. And anything. they are. And they are. Okay. Yes. Okay. So you can, so you can yeah, so they, they, you will have actually a lot of Russian speakers within the Hebrew-speaking congregations. So what percentage of the Hebrew-speaking congregations are Sabras? That's, that's, the, that's an interesting question. So that's about 28%. Wow. That's really interesting. Wow. I would expect it to be the highest percentage, but uh, Which that's it is. really interesting. Really, really interesting. These are fascinating statistics. Uh, oh, what do uh, we have here? Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, to compare that because then we asked, uh, you asked earlier, does the members reflect what the pastors think? And this is, might be the clearest of the halakhically speaking Jewish ethnicity. So now this is not where they are born, but this is whether or not they are halakhically Jewish. And from in the, our online survey, you can see here that most of those who took the survey are halakhically Jewish. Mm-hmm. Well, the majority, Jewish, at least, right? The majority, 50, right? You have, 54 have 50, plus percent. Okay. Yes, exactly. Uh, 
a halachic dispute. You know, what Jewish. is other? So yes, yeah, so other that that that's um, they will have uh, they they will have been they will have converted at some point to Judaism, oh, I see. for example, okay. or or they will have yeah different okay. options like this. Yeah, this is absolutely fascinating. Um, do you have a little bit more time to talk to me about some of these theological questions that you'd asked yes. in the survey? All right. Any final words you want to share with the audience, David? Thank you so much for joining us. This has been absolutely fascinating. No, I want to. Uh, I say, of course, for your for your reader, for your listeners, mm -hmm. buy the book, absolutely, and, uh, and be amazed of uh, the the world that lies in front of you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiasWall.com.